All right, so we begin a brand new series. We just finished one leading up to Easter called The Witnesses, where we were preaching from the first person perspective uh, as Peter, as Paul, as James, and as John. So now Brian and I were a little nervous, like, we got to be just ourselves again? How is that going to work? You know, so we're coming to you just as, uh, as, as preachers um, in a new series called Growing Smaller in this series. And we're going to be talking about the, the paradox of spiritual greatness. Uh, when I was uh, in high school, one of the guys that I admired most was my high school football coach. Tremendous influence in my life as a young man, and I wanted to please him, and I played hard for him. And I remember um, after my junior year, he wrote me a little note, a little jot, a little note in a card. And I kept, I've lost it since, but I kept it for many years. On the note, he said, to Jeff, playmaker Frazier, be great, Coach Mack. That was the note. But to me, he, it was like he wrote a tome. I was overwhelmed. He thought, I'm a playmaker. He told me to be great. Now, in my young mind, adolescent mind, greatness, that, that, you know, that meant make great plays, get recognized, do great things, get your name in the paper, your picture in the paper, be all conference, all state, whatever, right? Do things that other people think are great and are recognized for it. I want to ask the question, what is greatness? What, what does greatness really look like? What does it look like in our culture? Well, for, for a young high school athlete, like what I described, right? Who, are, who would you say are the great people? Who is great? Who does our culture elevate, celebrate, and value as great? Hold that in your mind, and let's ask, what does the Scripture have to say about greatness? If you have your Bible, you can turn to Matthew 20, or follow with me as I read on the screens. Verses 25 through 28. From Matthew chapter 20. By the way, the context here of this, what I'm going to read, is right after James and John, brothers, uh, come and ask who's going to be the greatest, and then they don't get a satisfactory answer. So if you know the story, somebody goes on their behalf, their mommy. Their mother goes to Jesus and asks, who's going to sit on your right and on your left, Lord? Can you just see that? I mean, sometimes mothers haven't changed a lot in 2,000 years, right? Who, which, where, where are my boys going to be? Where's their place, Right? And this is part of Jesus' response, verse 25. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It could not be clearer. What does God think? What does greatness look like in God's eyes, in God's economy? Who's great? Notice, whoever would be great among you, it does not say, work really hard. Whoever would be great among you must achieve, right? Must strive, must pay the price of hard work, or must visualize your own success. Then you will be great. It's not what he says. You want to be great? You know, he says, basically, Jesus says, you know what it's like in the world. You know how the world defines greatness. You've lived with that. Let me tell you how my father looks at it. You want to be great? Serve somebody. Become a servant. Give your life away for the sake of others. This is totally countercultural. Now, I don't mean that our culture doesn't like service. It's an abstract idea. I think most people in our culture think it's a good thing that others would serve, especially them. Right? I've shared this story before, but years ago when I was a camp counselor, we had a, um, uh, a, tr a tradition at mealtime that you don't serve yourself from the plate. You serve others first. So I, and so this one young man who didn't understand the rule was putting all the fried chicken on his plate, and one of the guys said, hey, hey, we don't serve ourselves first. He went, oh, okay. Put all the chicken back in the bowl, handed the bowl to his friend, and said, well, then you serve me. <laughs> I don't think he quite grasped the concept, Right? We think service is a good thing as an abstract idea, but it's not, if you, let's be honest, it's not what our culture values. It's not what our culture celebrates. It's not who we praise, who we elevate in our culture, the servants. But it is what God values. It is what matters to him. It is greatness in his kingdom. This series, uh, Growing Smaller, is all about how do we take that Matthew 20 principle, if you want to be great, you must become a servant. How do we take that st statement, that principle, and apply it to our lives in every area? In our marriages, 
in our families, in our workplace, in our friendships, in our communities? How do we take Matthew 20, whoever would be great must become a servant, and make that live in our lives? To start, I want to talk about an area that may be most important to many of us, marriage. What does greatness, spiritual greatness, look like in a marriage? And when we were laying out the series, Pastor Brian and I, it dawned on me that I had preached on marriage just about a year ago. And I thought, well, I'm going to look for a new text and a new angle. But I thought, ah, I think that's the best place to go. So you may have heard some of this before. That's probably because God thinks you need to hear it again. So let's look on the classic text on marriage, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 through 33. Paul teaching here, and you'll notice he goes back and forth between an earthly human marriage and the spiritual metaphor of Christ in the church. Verse 21 of Ephesians 5. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. We'll come back to that. That's a rich text. It could take us months' worth of sermons to unpack that. But just for a moment before we get to that, have you noticed in our culture that people have, I think, at least I have, and I just read this text at a wedding a few hours ago. Have you noticed in our culture that people have an unrealistic view of marriage? Have you noticed this? Either unrealistically good, positive, or unrealistically negative. For example, I'm, not long ago I had a couple in for premarital counseling and they were, their parents told them they had to go see the pastor for premarital counseling and so they were there. And the young man said to me, well, we really don't need this because we just love each other. I thought that's exactly why you need this, right? <laughs> you know, this is, this is for people that have issues. We're so in love. We don't need this, he was saying. Well, you know, marriage is hard. Those of you who are married, you should be nodding your head in agreement. You should pay attention. Marriage is hard. It takes hard work. Many times my wife and I have climbed into bed after a long, hard day of marriage. Right? It's not easy, despite how we feel. And we'll come back to why that is in a moment. I also think people have an unrealistically bad view or negative view of marriage, don't they? They think, well, what's the point? It's just a piece of paper. As long as we know our commitment level, why have this ceremony, spend all this money, get it, some document signed? Who determines what that means anyway? I've heard that statement before. But as we see in Ephesians 5, God has an entirely different view of what marriage is. Now, most people think about this text, Paul's teaching on marriage, and by the way, if you know Ephesians 5, prior to this, he's talking about what it looks like to be filled with the Spirit, to live in the Spirit. Some people think, okay, he ends this discussion on the spirit, and then he changes subjects, and he starts talking about marriage. That's not at all what he's doing. The whole thing is in the context of Paul's teaching about what it means to live in the spirit of, with the spirit of God in our hearts, and applying that to every area of our lives. So it's not like Paul says, okay, I talked to you about marriage, or I talked about the spirit, now let's talk about marriage. What Paul is saying is, if you live with the spirit of Christ in your hearts, the Holy Spirit living in your lives, this is what a marriage should look like for a man and a woman who are living that way. In fact, the word submit that's referenced here, the text actually reads in the, in the original Greek, verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, wives to your husbands. Husbands to wives. So in other words, under the umbrella of mutual submission to each other, because we're living with the Holy Spirit directing our attitudes and our behaviors, this is how it should look. This is how it should play out. I did a premarital counseling for a couple of years ago, and the woman looked at me and she said, don't you dare read that at my wedding. Because she grew up in a family where that was used as a spiritual club to keep women in their place. Submit. 
do as I say, woman, kind of thing. And she said, I don't want to hear that. That's sad, but it's true in a lot of places. It's a total misunderstanding of what Paul's teaching. Paul is not teaching about who has the power, who calls the shots, who keeps who under their thumb. He's painting a picture of what it's supposed to look like when people submit to God first, are filled with his spirit, and then to each other. How does that look in a husband-wife relationship? That's what he's teaching about. I want to mention three things from this text about marriage. I'll just give them to you in order, and then we'll talk about them. First, the essence of marriage. The essence of marriage. Now, this is not a political message, and I don't want to go down this rabbit trail too far, but we cannot talk about marriage without me as a pastor and a minister of the gospel saying to you that the essence of marriage is defined for us by God in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. In fact, we'll go, let's go to Genesis if you have your Bibles, or if not, there's a giant screen you could look at. Verses 21 through 25 of Genesis chapter 2. If I can find my place. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. God has defined for us what marriage is, of the, the union of one man and one woman for life. That's God's plan. That's God's desire. We're not to second guess it. We're not to reinterpret it. We're not to redefine it. Now, again, there's lots of other avenues we could talk about, and I don't want to get off on that rabbit trail, but I just want to say that, that we believe marriage is defined by God, not by culture. as, by, as a, a relationship between a man and a woman for life. By the way, I love this part when, when, you know, this is the first example of, other than God's creation, this is the first example of human ar artistic creation in all the Bible. Adam's response, when God makes the woman, Adam's sleeping, that must have been a good nap, right? You wake up and God brings you your wife. And he goes, whoa, man, that's why she's called woman. That's not, that's a, I love that joke, but it's bad. So, so he brings her to him, right? He brings her to him. And Adam says, Notice in Hebrew, that he's, in, the word, in, the, in the English, he says, this at last. That phrase, this at last, a single word in Hebrew, it's an expression of finally. He's, he, he, he recites poetry. Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. This is what I've been waiting for. She's the one. It's the first example of human artistic expression in all the Bible, and it's when God brings man and woman together. Now, where were we? Who knows? Only I know. I don't even know. The essence of marriage, right, okay. So, um, the essence of marriage is not a declaration of how you feel in the moment. I said this to a couple just hours ago. They both look wonderful. They all feel great. It's a beautiful spring day. They're getting married. But the essence of marriage, biblical love, is not a declaration of feeling in the present moment. It's the promise of fidelity over a lifetime, regardless of how you feel. There's all the difference in the world between that and how our culture defines it. The biblical definition of love, marital love, is not a declaration of I feel this way about you right now, honey. It's I will be faithful to you for as long as God gives me breath, regardless of how I feel. That is radically countercultural. That's not how our culture defines love. I quote this all the time. I can't help myself. I think it's one of the best things outside the Bible on the idea of love and being in love. It's from C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity. Go home, get a copy, get online, get on your Kindle, read the chapter on uh, Christian marriage. He writes this. Being in love is a good thing, but it is not the best thing. There are many things below it, but there are also things above it. You cannot make it the basis of a whole life. It is a noble feeling, but it is still just that, a feeling. And now no feeling can be relied upon to last in its full intensity, or even to last at all. And in fact, regardless of what people say, the state called being in love usually does not last. But of course, ceasing to be in love need not mean ceasing to love. Love in the second sense, love as distinct from being in love, is not merely a feeling. It is a deep unity maintained by the will and deliberately strengthened by habit, reinforced by, in Christian marriages, the grace which both partners ask and receive from God. They can have this love for each other even at the moments when they do not like each other very much. 
as you love yourself even when you do not like yourself. They can retain this love even when each would easily say, would easily, if they allow themselves, be in love with someone else. Being in love first moves them to promise fidelity. This quieter, deeper, stronger biblical love enables them to keep the promise. It is on this love, Lewis says, that the engine of marriage is to be run. Being in love is only the spark that started it. I think that's brilliant and dead on and extremely biblical. We don't, in our culture, we define the relationship, marital or romantic or otherwise, not in terms of this kind of deep or quieter love. We define it in terms of chemistry. Not covenant love, but chemistry. How do I feel? How does he make me feel? What's the problem with that question? It's about me, right? Which has nothing to do with love. Love is about giving of myself for the other person. Sacrificing what I would prefer in my flesh, in my humanness, for the good of another. That's love. Love is not, you're not meeting my needs. You're not making me feel right. I'm not happy when I'm with you. I've shared this before, but years ago, I heard about a man who I knew pretty well who was going to leave his wife and four kids. Just going to leave them. And when I, she convinced him to come meet with me, I don't know what I was going to say to him, but maybe he thought checking off the pastor box that I could be free to go. So we sat down, and he said, I'm just not happy, and I haven't been happy for a long time. I wanted to choke him while he was drinking his coffee. <laughs> I didn't have a pastor, but I wanted to, right? I wanted to say, it's not about your happiness. It's not about you. That's why you're unhappy, because you're so focused on yourself. Again, we're, well, at least I'm off of my notes. But love, biblical love, marital love, is not the declaration of how you feel in the moment. It's the promise of your faithfulness over the course of your life, regardless of how you feel. So when you think you are falling in love with someone, to those of you who aren't married or have been or hope to be again someday, you are actually falling in love with your image of that person. And those of you who have been married for a while, you know this. Out of, and because you, therefore, you must eventually fall out of love with your image of that person. And you know how this happens, right? It can be painful. So you can know the real person and love them better. The essence of marriage, then, is the biblical love, which is not a declaration of how you feel in the moment, but a promise of faithfulness over a lifetime regardless of how you feel. That is God's promise to us. Let's talk about the power of marriage then, the power of marriage. And we got a hint of this in Ephesians chapter 5. We saw a little hint, uh, being filled with the Spirit. If you go back in Ephesians, this is not on the screens, I don't think, it might be. I forgot if I gave this to you. It is, Ephesians 2, 18 through 21. Ephesians chapter 2, 18 through 21. For through him we both have access in one Spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the, the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. And you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. The Spirit of God coming and dwelling in our hearts. When we, when we trust Christ's death on the cross as payment for our sin, the Spirit comes into our lives and it begins to build us individually and together, remake us. Now go to Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 through 19. That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. What's the point of being filled with the Spirit? To know the love of God and let it pour out of us in our relationships. That's what Paul's talking about here in the book of Ephesians. Now, as we go back then to verses 19 through 20 of Ephesians 5, before we come to that verse 21 where we started a moment ago, Addressing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, wives to your husbands. You see how it flows? Paul's talking about what's God want to do? He wants to redeem your life, fill you with his spirit. Why? So you'll grasp how great his love is. Why? So that will be how you treat each other. Here's how that looks then. He says, here's how you behave in a marriage, if that's the case. You see, Paul's not talking about who gets to hold the hammer, who gets to keep somebody else under their thumb. 
common mistake I think that many couples make is that they, they assume, they make their spouse or their fiance or their significant other the ultimate source of their significance in love. Idolatry is rampant in marriages and in families. We're living in a culture, we don't even see it, but I see it when people come to me. In marriages and in families, raising our kids too, we'll talk about that in a couple weeks, where we idolize our kids, make them their achievement, their success, their, how they do is, is, our, is our God, really. In marriages, it happens the same way. If you make your husband, your wife, your fiance, someone that you're dating or courting, the source of your identity, your significance, the, the ultimate source of love for you, you, it will ruin the relationship because they will not be able to be for you what God intends them to be because you're trying to extract from them something that only God can give you. That's why whenever I perform a marriage, I'm always saying you should love your wife second only to Christ, but second, never first. The key is to love God more than your spouse. Again, C.S. Lewis said, I doubt that any of us could love another human being too much. So the problem is not loving our husband or our wife too much. I don't think we live in a culture where people are loving too much, that they were suffering from that. The problem is loving too much in relation to our love to God. So it's not a matter of loving your husband or wife less, but loving God more so that you can love them better in turn. That's the key. We are his bride. He sacrificed all for us. So husbands and wives, look at the love of Christ for you. I say this at every wedding. Many of you have been to weddings that I've done. You've heard me say this. When Paul is talking about submission, he's not, he says to the wife, submit in everything to your, to your husband. He says to the husband, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That doesn't in English have as hard an edge to it, does it? Sounds nice. Love her as Christ loved the church, give himself up for her. That sounds nice. Submit. That sounds harder, right? But think about it for a minute. Wives, submit to your husbands and everything. Husbands, be like Jesus. How did he give himself up for the church? Was it metaphoric? Was it figurative? How did G Jesus give himself up for his bride, us, the church? Death. So wives have to submit. Husbands, you have to die. Right? <laughs> and it's not talking about die, taking a bullet or jumping in front of a train. You do that for your wife because you're not thinking about it. It's talking about dying to your need to be first. Dying to your selfishness. That's profoundly more difficult than jumping in front of a moving vehicle. Dying to our selfishness. That's hard. Now, what happens in marriages is we're always focused on what the other person is supposed to be doing. I can't tell you the number of men who said, well, she's just not a submissive wife. I get the women who said, well, he's not a spiritual leader in the home. Right? They have these fights. What are they focused on? What she should be doing. What he should be doing. When God is saying, stop. Look at what I'm calling you to do. Man, start loving your wife as Christ loved the church. Start sacrificing for her good. I'll be clear with you. I do believe the Bible does teach that God does give leadership, headship, authority to the man. If that rubs you the wrong way, women, bear with me. But he gives it for one purpose. God does from Genesis to Revelation, talk about male leadership and authority. Why? For one purpose, so that we men could sacrifice it for the good of our wives. So we could lay it down in service to them and our families. The Bible only knows one kind of leader, a sacrificial servant leader. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 20? You know how they, the rulers of the Gentiles act, they lord it over them. That's how they view leadership, greatness. Not so with you. You want to be great, you must be a servant. Our model is Jesus, who had all authority in heaven on earth, all authority given to him. What did he do with it? Did he say, get in line, you sinners? He surrendered it. Philippians 2 tells us he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. He gave it up. So God gave him all authority. What did he do with it? Gave it up so that he could go to the cross for us. Men, that's your model. God gives you leadership to surrender it, to lay yourself down. Submission becomes much less a big deal if we start doing that, man, doesn't it? There are a lot less women itching and getting anxious about submitting if we have men who are dying to themselves for the good of others. But we have neither in our culture. Present company excluded, of course. Last, the, pur the purpose of marriage. The purpose of marriage. What does our culture say is the purpose of marriage? What does our culture say? What's the reason you get married? 
What does Jerry Maguire say in that, in that movie, right? You complete me, right? Marriage makes us, isn't that what he's, isn't that, I'm, okay, moving on. <laughs> marriage in our culture, the reason you get married is, is, to, is to fill some void in your life, to make you happy, to, to make you whole. Now, I'm not saying there isn't happiness and wholeness and fulfillment that comes from marriage. There is. There is. And God designed it that way. But the purpose of marriage fundamentally is not to make you happy. That sound depressing? It's not to make you unhappy necessarily, but the purpose is not your own happiness. Gary Thomas wrote a book called Sacred Marriage. I highly recommend it. In his book, he says, perhaps God has given us marriage not to make us happy, but to make us holy. What a great statement. Timothy Keller uses this analogy. He says, he t- talks about a gem tumbler in his book, Real Marriage. Uh, he says, uh, or the meaning of marriage, he says, uh, gems go into this tumbler as rough cut stones. They don't look like much. They put them in this gem tumbler where there's rocks and other stones in there, and they tumble around, I guess. I looked it up online. And they come out shiny with their rough edges knocked off, bright. They still need to be polished and cut, but they bang around against each other, and they come out beautiful. He uses that as an example of marriage. Marriage can be bumpy. It can be rough. It can feel like you're being knocked around a bit. But God has given it to you for your holiness to change you. If you come to a relationship, any relationship, especially a marriage, thinking, well, I just, she's perfect just as she is. He's perfect. And I hope, well, that never happens. Women are never saying he's perfect just as he is. But anyway, and, and I hope that he, nothing changes. You're kidding yourself. You're living in la-la land. Uh, Lou Smeads wrote a book about the meaning of marriage, and he said, my wife has been married to five men over the last 25 years, and they've all been me. Right? <laughs> we change. God works on us, shapes us, in the context of relationships, especially marital relationships. Have you ever, is, men and women who are married right now, has it ever dawned on you that maybe God gave you your wife to shape you into the image of a son? Maybe God gave you your husband? Some of the difficulty and pain you feel may actually be the activity of God shaping you if you'll open yourself to it. I'm not saying it's all supposed to be difficult, but the, if, we're, if we come to marriage looking for our own happiness, we will be disappointed. That's not God's plan. It's to make us holy. And then we get joy, which is infinitely greater than circumstantial happiness. That's the purpose of marriage, to glorify and honor God and to make us like his son. Now back to this idea of submission and respect and love and all of this. Contrary to cultural opinion, when a man and a woman live this way, the Ephesians 5 way, one is not diminished, neither one is diminished in value or significance. Both are elevated and God is glorified. I believe that with all my heart. And I'm convinced that our world needs more marriages like that. What is, this shouldn't be a trick question, what is the primary metaphor Jesus used to describe his love for his church? Bride and bridegroom. He had lots to choose from. He's the creator of all that exists. Think about the expanse and the wealth of illustrations God could have used when he wanted to talk about how can I explain in terms you will understand how I love you. He talked about bride and bridegroom. What that means, friends, and I fall woefully short of this. I teased a friend of mine before the service. This one's for you. You better pay attention. But it's for me, really. Our world is in desperate need of men who surrender themselves for the good of their wives and their families and of women who lovingly submit to a man who's living that way. Our, because what's a Christian marriage supposed to be? A window, a picture, into the, to the watching world, into how good and loving and merciful God is. Husbands and wives, the way you speak to each other. When I was coaching football years ago as a volunteer in a local high school, I didn't realize how much of coaching is just coaches sitting around talking about stuff and their players, just sitting around. And we would talk about players, and eventually we just talk about families and stuff. And one of the things that always made me uneasy was when these guys started just ripping on their wives, talking about them in just ways that made me cringe. And I, I, I struggled with it. Kind of elbow me, like, isn't that right, you know? No, it's not right. It isn't right. One of the best testimonies I think we can have, men, is not only just don't avoid that, but talk about how awesome your wife is to your friends. You ever do that? I, I'm, I bet most of you here have joked about what a pain she is. Have you ever talked to your friends about how, how beautiful she is, how wonderful she is, how grateful you are to have her? And wives, it goes the other way too, by the way. 
I'm sure you've complained to your girlfriends about yeah. things he does. <laughs> do you do that? <laughs> Maybe that's just me. What if you started doing the opposite? What if the world began to get a picture by the way we treated our spouses and future spouses of how good and merciful and gracious God is? Growing smaller is the theme of this series. We're trying to apply the Matthew 20 principle to marriage. You want to be great? Give yourself up. You want to be great in your, you want to have a great marriage? Surrender your rights to your own happiness, to have what you want. Start giving your life away to serve her, him, and you watch what God does. I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow, but you watch what God does and let the world watch who God is. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this gift which you designed from creation, that a man and woman would come together and reflect your glory. We confess to you that those of us that are married fall woefully short of that. We ask for your grace and courage to help us in that. For those that are yet to be or hope to be someday married, bless them with patience. Help them to make you the ultimate source of their love and significance so that when and if you do bring to them the person, they'll be ready. Lord, bless us so that the world might see through the way we love each other who you are. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.